English looks like this. But it used to look like this. These ancient letters are called runes, and I think they might be better. Allow me to explain in another Rob words. Okay, so runes are the alphabet that was used to write down the English language before we started using the alphabet we use now, the alphabet of the Romans. An alphabet that is utterly inadequate, lacking letters for some common sounds in our language while having multiple letters for others. It is an alphabet meant for writing out Latin, not English. Whereas this set of characters here is specifically designed to efficiently represent the sounds of the English language, or more accurately, Old English as it was back then over a thousand years ago. But I think it could be used for the English we speak today. Now before you dismiss this as just another one of Rob's silly alphabetical schemes, just hang on a moment, because I am in good company in exploring this idea. This is a beautiful copy of The Hobbit, the masterpiece by author and linguist J.R.R. Tolkien. His fascination with Old English and the language of the Vikings, Old Norse, is interwoven throughout this book and the Lord of the Rings trilogy, not just in the names of people and places in the text, but also in the illustrations drawn by the man himself. They are littered with runes. Look at the ones on this map. This is the written form of Dwarvish, but it's actually just Anglo-Saxon runes. And they don't spell out some mystical message in a made-up or long-dead language. This, this is modern English. Stand by the grey stone when the thrush knocks, and the setting sun with the last light of Durin's day will shine upon the keyhole. So it can be done. Runes work for the language we speak today. Tolkien proved it. But before we decide if runing writing is right for the modern age, there is a whole lot that we need to understand first about how runes were used in the past and how they've been more recently abused. But let's start with where runes came from and why they look the way they look. To do that, we have to go to Scandinavia and way back in time to even before the age of the Vikings, although we will get round to them, I promise. The oldest surviving runes date from around the second century, and they're concentrated around southern Scandinavia, so that is runologists' best guess at where they were invented. However, you know, it might just be that more runic inscriptions from there survived than elsewhere because of a tradition in the area of burying things in bogs. Bogs are a great way of preserving objects that would have otherwise perished elsewhere. The style of rune from back then is the one you're most likely to have come across. This is the runic alphabet used from at least the second century to the seventh century, and it's known as the Elder or Older Fudark. In much the way that our word alphabet comes from the Greek names of the first two letters of our alphabet, alpha and beta, the Fudark is named for the sounds made by its first six characters. F, U, F, A, R, K. And the rest of these 24 runes each make their own sound too. You know, one of the things I find amazing looking at the runes next to their Roman alphabet equivalents is that so many of them match up. Look at the B letter and the R letter and the H and the S. There are too many of these pairings to be coincidental. And that's because it isn't coincidental. The fact that this alphabet from the northern reaches of Europe has symbols in common with writing systems from the continent's southern limits is a reminder of how much more connected the world was 2,000 years ago than we often think of it as being, or at least than I think of it as being anyway. These alphabets were in sufficient contact with each other to influence one another. Of course, the runes look like funky, pointy, stylized versions of their Latin equivalents because the Elder Futhark is composed entirely with straight lines. Why is that? Well, the answer is simple, because it makes these characters easier to carve, because that's really the only way in which they were used. The Scandinavians of this period are not big writers. Epic storytellers, sure, but not fans of putting pen to paper, or rather, quill to vellum. But what they did do was inscribe things. They would carve, scrape, or bash these symbols 
into objects made of wood, metal, or stone, like this incredible memorial stone said to bear Norway's oldest last will and testament that just blew my mind when I visited Oslo's historical museum. It's from around 400 AD. These runes are also used to mark ownership of property or to claim credit for handiwork. On this replica of a 5th century drinking horn, it says, Ek Hlawagastis Holtias Horna Tawido. I, Hlawagastis, son of Holt, made the horn. Or something along those lines. It's written in Proto Norse, the precursor to Old Norse. Runes are also used to label things. Combs have been found that just say, home on them, and they used to decorate weaponry and jewellery, like this coin-like disc called a Bactiate that just has the word ale inscribed onto it. I love it. I want it. I want it. And then I also have to mention magic, although I'm not going to dwell on it, because so far as I can see there isn't a huge amount of evidence of runes being used for mystical purposes at the time that we're talking about. It is primarily a writing system. However, the Roman historian Tacitus, who wrote a lot about his encounters with Germanic tribes, wrote in the first century AD about a curious divination ritual that he observed, in which he said villagers would break off the branch of a fruit tree and slice it into strips. They mark these by certain signs and throw them, as random chance would have it, onto a white cloth. Then a state priest prays to the gods and, gazing to the heavens, picks up three separate strips and reads their meaning from the marks scored on them. It's thought those fortune-telling marks might well have been runes. Now one of the motivations behind this video is to sort of reclaim runes, because without a doubt, particularly over the past century, they've been abused. They've been adopted by far-right groups all over the world, most notably the Nazis, based upon ridiculous, manufactured ideas about what they mean. And I'm going to get into all of that later, because it's important. You may have seen that just recently a far-right party won a state election here in Germany for the first time since the end of the Second World War. But your understanding of why that happened may well have been influenced by the specific outlet that gives you your news. However, with ground news, you get the full picture. On that story alone, it's pulled together over 500 sources from around the world and across the political spectrum, allowing us to compare the coverage. For example, you can see some right-leaning websites blaming left-leaning members of Germany's governing coalition for the rise of the far right, saying citizens have had enough. Whereas outlets on the left stress what it all means for Germany's minorities, calling it a punch to the country. Now, I've worked with Ground News for about a year now, because I think what they do is important. Plus, I find their interest pages, like the ones for Germany, the UK, and the US that I use, make it really easy to stay on top of the stories that matter to me. It can do the same for you. Use my special link, ground.news slash robwords, or scan this QR code to get 40% off unlimited access like me, and stay fully informed with Ground News. Thanks to Ground News for sponsoring this video. So, so far we've just looked at the Elder Fothark, but it's with a later incarnation of the runic alphabet that, from an English speaker's perspective, things start to get really interesting. From the 7th century onwards, in Britain, a new runic alphabet is starting to be used, a tweaked and extended version of the Elder Fothark, designed to better suit the language of the Anglo-Saxons, who'd been living there for a couple of hundred years by this point. That language was what we now call Old English, and the new alphabet was the Fothork. Like the Elder Fothark, the Fothork was named after the first six characters, but in this adapted version of the alphabet they were no longer the same. The Germanic dialects in Britain, and also in Frisia on the continent where the Fothork was also being used, were different to other dialects. English has always been a bit of a pain in the ass. So, for example, to take into account Old English's weird vowel system, two new vowel runes were added. Anyway, it's this Anglo-Frisian Fothork, these Anglo-Saxon runes that Tolkien used for Dwarvish, and that I think we could use today. Okay, so how is this better than what we've currently got? Well, alright. Number one. It has this guy. 
a single letter representing what we currently spell out with two th. This rune is called Thorn, and I have lauded it many times on this channel because it actually survived the transition to the Latin alphabet and continued to be used in English until as recently as the 14th century. Indeed, it's still used in the Icelandic alphabet today, something that brought me endless geeky excitement while I was there recently. English, like Icelandic, needs this letter more than any other European language, and that is why I am Hardcore Thorn. Reason number two why this alphabet is better is this rune called Win. It makes the W sound without resorting to the bodge that we currently have, which is literally using a double U or double V. This one also survived into Middle English until the printing press killed it off. I think we need it back. That is why I am also for the win. Reason number three why the Fudork is better than our current alphabet is this letter, which represents the ng sound, something we currently write with an N and a G. But when writing, we're using those two letters together all of the time. Why not save space and time with just one letter? Reason number four is that the Fudork's nine vowel characters are much better equipped to represent the twenty odd vowel sounds in English than the pathetic six that we're currently having to get by with. And number five, the Fudork only has one k letter instead of our current three, which let's face it is ridiculous. Honestly, I could go on. For example, a further delightful aspect of the Fudork is that every letter has a name, and that name isn't just a noise like F or L or E. It's a full word with a meaning, charming meanings like thorn, as I already mentioned, but also oak and ash and yew, like feor, which means wealth, and win, which means joy, and also this one that's called gift. And not only do these names bring these letters to life, but they also tell you how to pronounce them. They all start with the sound that the letter makes, all except for two, which are sounds that couldn't appear at the start of words in Anglo-Saxon, like ng. We know about the names of the runes because of poems from back then that listed them, or in the case of this one, give a series of riddles, each one leading to the name of a rune. So the names are charming, it has a better set of letters, and it looks kick ass. But does the Fudork work? Are these runes fit for purpose, fit for everyday use? It's a fair question, because so far we've only heard of them being used for the odd carving here or there. But elsewhere, and during the same time period, runes were being used much more broadly, and until as recently as the 18th century in some places. For more on that, let's cross to the Nordics, and to me on holiday there last week. Rob. Thanks, future me. Yes, welcome to Oslo, the capital of Norway. We should talk about the use of runes here in Scandinavia, because it was much more extensive than it ever was in England to represent Old English, where in England it was mainly used to mark objects to show ownership, craftsmanship, or for a dedication. Scandinavian inscriptions could be a lot longer and could cover a whole range of other purposes too. We partially know this because of an amazing discovery that was made here in Norway, actually in Bergen though, not here in Oslo, back in 1955. A fire ripped through the city's beautiful waterfront, but though it was a disaster, it led to the most significant runic find of the 20th century. 670 pieces of wood carved with runes, runes from the so-called younger Fudarks, which are the later simplified versions of the elder Fudark that we talked about already. It's actually the versions that were used by the Vikings. And these hundreds of objects show just how mundane, just how day-to-day -day the use of runes could be. There's a massive online database of all the runic inscriptions ever found in Scandinavia, and you can find all the inscriptions from the Bergen fire there. And they include simple little things like a simple prayer. There's ones that just say Ave Maria on them. There are declarations of love. And there's also undoubtedly my absolute favourite one, which is an apparent scolding of someone who has spent too long down the pub. It was found in the ruins of a tavern. And it says, Gither says, you should go home. Now that's funny enough, right? Someone being told 
to go home. But what I find extra funny is that there is an accompanying inscription, clearly carved by a different hand, that is completely incomprehensible. It's thought that it's probably the reply from whoever was being told to come home. It would appear that they were so far gone that they couldn't inscribe a decent reply. So though it doesn't seem like runes were really used day to day in England, for Old English, there is a precedent for them being the daily means of communication here in Scandinavia. Interesting. Back to you, future Rob. So there we have it. You've put on weight. So there we have it. Runes can be used as a day-to-day -day means of communication. So what's stopping us? Other than the enormous faff of having to replace every existing text with a runic equivalent and also having to relearn to read. Well, it's perhaps that thing I mentioned earlier. The way in which runes have been misused and therefore arguably tainted by extremist groups, most notably the Nazis who used them in their iconography and even as their most notorious emblem. I want to talk about this and the subsequent use by other political extremists because the more light you shine on it, the more ridiculous it becomes and the more you realise that fascists have no rights to take ownership of a heritage that people from all over Europe and beyond share. The Nazi fascination with runes is born out of something called the Folkish Movement, a movement in 19th century Germany and Austria based around the idea of a common Germanic identity. Folkish activity could be as benign as, you know, going on a hike with friends who share your love of the Bavarian countryside. But there are also more extreme ideas based around the myth of being descended from an ancient superior race called the Aryans, a race that supposedly possessed wisdom that has since been lost. And then in 1908, a superstitiously minded man called Guido von Liszt from Austria published a book called Das Geheimnis der Runen, The Secret of Runes. In it, he set out his belief the runes held the key to this ancient Aryan wisdom. But not just any runes, the runes of an as yet undocumented ancient Futhark that had been revealed specifically and only to him during a period of temporary blindness. Liszt's spurious Futhark looked most like the younger Futhark used by the Vikings, but with names for the runes that were closer to the Anglo-Saxon ones. His writing popularised the idea that these runes were ancient holy symbols charged with wisdom in their shapes, their names and their sounds. And it is this superstitious belief that was behind the Nazis' use of runes. For example, their use in the logo of their paramilitary organisation, the SS. Those are two S runes, if you like. And they've been used not just because of the organisation's name, the Schutzstaffel, but because the senior Nazi Heinrich Himmler was a superstitious man who believed in all the folkish rune nonsense. He believed what Liszt had written about that rune being an historic symbol for victory, which it never was. Its Anglo-Saxon name, Siegel, bore no relation to the German word for victory, Sieg, as Liszt and Himmler appear to have believed. Siegel meant son. And the names and meanings of other runes were similarly distorted by the Nazis and continue to be now by other groups. I'm not going to show any of the modern fascist logos using runes because I don't want to give them the time of day. But what I will do is show you the final rune of Liszt's pseudo Fothark, the one he believed held the key to the greatest mystery of the Aryo Germans, the union of the human and the divine. A rune that doesn't appear in any of the other actual runic alphabets this one. Simultaneously tainting not only runes, but also a near global symbol of good health. To talk about modern uses of runes and to only talk about neo-Nazis is to do a great disservice to other groups who still use and revere them. Religious groups like modern day pagans who place great symbolic meaning in the shapes and names of runes, but aren't using them as an excuse to hate and to abuse other people. I'm not in the best position to tell you precisely what these groups believe in, but there are plenty of places on the internet and on this very website where they'll tell you themselves. Oh, and also, you probably see a rune every time you take out your phone. The Bluetooth symbol is a combined rune made up of the symbols for H and B to give the initials of Harald Bluetooth, a Viking king famed for bringing multiple tribes together. 
he knew how to establish a good connection. But anyway, what I've been focusing on in this video is what all the historians I've read have said was the primary use of runes, and that was as a system of writing, a system that I think we should take another look at. Still not convinced? I'll leave a link to a rune keyboard and a Latin alphabet to runic alphabet converter below. Have a play around with them. But if I've already won you over, why not consider buying one of these t-shirts? They're available at robwords.com slash shop, but I'll leave a link down below. While you're down there, make sure you take advantage of that exclusive ground news deal, and then watch this video next. I'll catch you in the next thing. Take care.